Hey gang, how's it going? I just started the stream and I popped into the chat. Welcome to session three. So I only see one person online in the chat right now, but what are you going to do? So you'll see I have a different venue right now, and you might also notice that we have some whirring and buzzing in the background. I have the tree in our front yard being nearly removed. It's being trimmed so much. So I moved to a location where that won't be as much of a problem, but if you hear a little bit of it, meh, it'll be all right. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by sharing out our notes. And I've uploaded these to our Google Share. OK, cool, here you go. So welcome to session three. As usual, I will post the link to the recorded video following the session. Uh, we didn't really have a whole lot in our chat last time. Uh, two students, I think, asked a question. Maybe it's just Patrick? I don't know. Uh, but the questions were addressed in the video and then addressed literally in the video. So I didn't see a reason to upload those logs. I'll go ahead and put whatever chat logs we may have if there's anything substantive in those bad boys to the uh, Google Drive. OK. Uh, let's see. The first thing I wanted to cover is hashing. So I want to talk about what hashing is all about. Hashing is very important for multiple, multiple reasons. So uh, here in the document, you'll see I have a couple different links. I have one simply to hash function, and then I have another one for the most common type of hash, at least that you're going to see this day and age, which is the Message Digest 5, the MD5. And then I'll talk about why technically that is problematic and why we're moving on to something else which is a different hashing algorithm altogether, which is the SHA-2 family of hashing. And I'll discuss why those are important. And then I'm going to show you some examples on how to actually do it. So let me pop back to video A. So one of the things that we face that's problematic in the digital age is when you try to prevent something as evidence, whether it be in court or whether it be to work, regardless of this, I'll use that word again, when you provide it, one of the problems you run against is that people are going to come back and say, well, it could have been faked, or it could have been edited, or it could have been blah, 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 blah. And because, I mean, we're, we live in the Photoshop age, right? Every time you see a, a picture on the internet, people's common response is, ah, it's Photoshopped. Well, the same thing applies even more so with digital evidence. If actor A is going to bring a claim against actor B, and actor A says, oh, I captured this network traffic from this guy over here. This is the bad guy, my, this hand over here. I captured his traffic, and I saw him doing really bad things. You take that into a court of law, and you provide the packet capture, and you say, here you go. This is evidence A. You know, I don't know how that works. And the judge says, okay, sure. And then the defendant, his lawyer, his or her lawyer, is basically going to run against a couple different things. First off, how is that traffic captured? And when we say how, we don't just mean like, oh, yeah, I use Wireshark. Oh, no, 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 no. They, they want to know every little thing about it. Another part of it is you actually are not allowed to use certain types of digital evidence if it's not captured in your daily standard workflow activities. So, for example, if I target that user because I think something may be amiss and literally I just think it, like I have no other evidence to point toward that, um, I can't even use that in certain states, but this is not a class on law, and to be honest, I suck with law. Luckily, I don't work in the, the legal realm. I work in a company where I do, we do what we want, <laughs> so it works out well. If we have to take anything to court with the company, then we follow a lot of different standards, which is one of the things I'm going to talk about right now. So aside from being attacked, basically, for how you gathered the evidence you're providing, another thing you're going to have to deal with is... How is that evidence intact? So if you remember in session two, we've only this is the third one, so I'm pretty sure it was session two. We talked about logical evidence files. So logical evidence files is the default format for in case stuff. If you're not familiar with in case, it's like the, the de facto, it's the go-to um, I guess enterprise evidence collection utility. Forensic, forensicating tool, if you will, forensicating tool. Write that down. <laughs> so 
Anyways, the reason that file format is very useful is because it has hashing built in. Hashing is a way to prevent tampering, well not prevent tampering, but uh, prove tampering, I should say. So, well let's just get into it. I'm going to bring up the article right now, so let me s switch over to this guy. There we go. Hide my personal email there. Cool. So I should mention one of the problems with this current setup is I don't have my secondary monitor, so I can't see exactly what I'm streaming. So there may be a two or three second delay when I'm changing windows just to make sure that I have the right thing on screen. All right, I'm going to just Google hashing, and it'll probably, yeah, there we go, brings up the exact same article that I have in our notes. And so this article here, it's it's this is what I consider the epitome of one of those YouTube, or excuse me, YouTube, uh, Wikipedia articles that just goes a little too far and doesn't just tell you straight out simply why is this important, who used it, yada, yada, yada. Uh, like many Wikipedia articles, people just like want to be a technical writer too much, I guess. But if we start off with the first part here, it says a hash function is any function that can be used to map digital data of arbitrary size, size does not matter, to digital data of fixed size with slight differences in input data producing very big differences in output data. Okay, that's cute. And I can read the rest of that paragraph, but I'm not going to. So a hash algorithm is very simple. The hash algorithm will take and recursively run through a bunch of little sub-algorithms. will take a large data set or any size data set, excuse me, does not matter how big it is, not matter how small it is. So it can be a one terabyte file or it can be a, a one bit file, literally just a one, you know. And what it's going to do is that the purpose of the hashing function is to provide a unique value. So if you're familiar with like chain block encoding, if you've ever taken a cryptography course and you're familiar with like CBC or something along those lines, think of that where the first sub-algorithm is fed into the second, which is fed into the third, which is fed into the fourth, and so on and so forth. The purpose of hashing is that regardless of my input, my output is always going to be a very unique, same size value. So let me give you... Oh, actually, before I do that, let me scroll down a little bit here. Oh, wow, this article is long. Oh, goodness. Yeah, most of this just honestly confuse you up. up. Yeah. Look at this. Oh, wow. I'm reading through this part for the first time. Look at this. is horrible. Uh, what is all this? Oh, there's math. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, look at that. All right. If you want to read that, knock yourself out. Uh, let's just do it the better way. The better way. I'm going to switch over to Kali Linux, and I'm going to talk about, well, I'm going to capture a file just randomly. I'm just going to capture something off my local host, I think. And then from there, I'm going to, well, we're going to hash it. So there are two common types of hashes that you're going to see. One is called the Message Digest 5, and another one is called the SHA. In fact, you know what? Let me, I fibbed. We're going to go back to this game. Here, let's go to the top. Oops. I typed today. Well, Wikipedia knew what I meant. Cool. Here you go, the MD5. Algorithm is a widely used cryptographic hash function producing a 128-bit or 16-byte hash value typically expressed in text format as a 32-digit hexadecimal number. Now, if you remember what we were just talking about, regardless of size when it comes to input, we're always going to receive a 32-digit hexadecimal number. That number should be unique for any and every type of data that you can provide to it. Notice I said the word should, and that is because it is not always unique, but I'm going to digress on that particular point right now. Unless... Yeah, I lied again. I'm not going to digress. I'm going to look that up. Uh, what do we want? Collisions. Uh, no, not that one. Oh, I know what I want. I want uh, hash collision. There we go. So I already have this example, by the way, in the Word document. 
but uh, collision computer science is the one that we want. So, in computer science, a collision or clash is a situation that occurs when two distinct pieces of data have the same hash value, that's our guy, check some fingerprint or cryptographic digest. So think about it this way. When you have a one-way algorithm, which, by the way, hashing is one way. You cannot revert a 32-character hexadecimal value back to your original input value, especially if it's like, I mean, just imagine doing that with a, a one terabyte input value. You're just running different computations on some of the input to derive a, a unique value. So it's, it's considered one way. You're not going to go the other way. One problem that you have when dealing with hashing is that one, so the way that the algorithms work, I'm not touching that. If you've taken a cryptography course, you're probably already familiar with it. And if you're not, you can look up MD5 algorithm via Google or Bing if you're so inclined. But, uh, and you'll find out exactly how it works. Good luck with that, by the way. It's a bit daunting at first. But it's, once you understand it, it's a fairly simple concept. In fact, once you understand it and you're dealing with forensics, you no longer care about how it works. You just care about getting those values and putting them in your notes. It's pretty simple. Okay, so a collision occurs when the MD, well, the hash, regardless of the hash type, is the same for two dislike inputs. Meaning, let's say I have a malware sample. In fact, here, I'm probably tired of staring at that screen, so let me just do this. Okay, let's say that you have a, a malicious software sample that you've pulled off of a host, or for that matter, since we're doing network forensics, right? A user accesses a malicious site on accident, redirect, email link, whatever, and they download a file. Whoops. And they open the file. Whoops. And your job is to find out what, what's the file doing. I think in session one, I made that up. I think it was session one. This was either one or two, right? We talked about when a user executes malicious software on his or her host, Windows, Macintosh, and whatever, the, the malicious software has the capability to alter itself and, for that matter, delete itself. So a common term for software that downloads additional malware from the Internet, is there's two different ones. There's either a downloader or a dropper, basically the same thing, to be honest. When you go through malware analysis, essentially a malware uh, dropper is something that's a little smaller container file. It can even be shell code if you're familiar with that. That just executes on the host, reaches out, grabs the real malware, and then typically deletes itself. So let's say that your user gets the second stage malware, and you are responding to an incident. And you're looking at this second stage malware, and you run the hash value for that, and you find out that it's uh, ZeusBot or something like that, or a little more insidious, something that's like brand new. Ooh. So is your main focus the malware that's actually on the host? Yes. But you also need to know about the guy over here, the little guy, the downloader, the dropper. Like, well, what happened to that? Well, it deleted itself. Well, that sucks. Well, that's why you have network forensics. You can go through the packet capture, and you can pull it out. So when you pull it out, let's say you hash it. You run it through the message digest 5 sum tool, which is... Uh, it's not a core util, but it's included in many, many different, uh, at least Debian-based distros. I'm a Debian guy. I don't, I don't like Red Hat. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not starting a war here, but I, you know, it's just me. So I run MD5SUM, and I get a hash value that's very specific to that particular sample. Well, let's just say that I search that on the Internet, and I find that it's been analyzed. I'm like, cool. I don't have to do analysis. Or maybe I don't have to do as much analysis. Well, so that's, that's what you want. You want to have a hash value that's unique to that sample. Fantastic. Unfortunately, a collision would mean that when you search for that hash value, you find what you think is that sample, but it turns out to be something completely different. So in order to find a collision, it's fairly simple. I mean, one thing you can do is just look at the size of the data, that the, um, your result that you found. One site that's very handy for looking up hash values, especially for malicious software, is... Virus total. I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with virus total. But if you do any type of malware analysis, this is going to be your best friend. You're going to be using it all freaking day long. But essentially, here you throw in a, an MD5 value or a SHA or any other type of hash. See right there, the first thing that's in gray in the background says hash. And it will tell you if it's been analyzed before. Virus total is an aggregation portal, if you will, 
for various different back-end engines for antivirus utilities. Meaning, I have a file and I want to know if it's malicious. In the old days, you would just go Google a file name. Well, file names don't really tell you much at all, especially since they can be changed by literally anyone. My three-year-old daughter has changed file name to my computer and confused me for quite a, <laughs> for a good, good amount of time. So anyways, uh, file names, eh, you hash it and search the hash, and then you can see if you found the exact same thing. Now, say you search the hash and you see the size of the exact same size of the file you're looking at. You're pretty darn sure that's the exact same thing and that there's already been analysis. However, if you hash it and you find out that their file size is completely different, it looks like you might have a collision. Collisions with hashes are not common. They're very rare, in fact. And to be honest, there was... Oh, I didn't have it handy. I, I'll try to look for it and put it in your notes. Let me put it in the notes now for you to look at later. Uh, hash five paper. There was a technical paper published in the uh, one of the IEEE symposiums. It's available on the iExplorer, I think it's called, <clears throat> digital library, and it was basically forcing hash collisions to prove that they can be possible. And I don't remember what year it was, but it, it's the idea is they're so rare that a group of people had to come together in a lab and get a bunch of PhD math people together and hey, let's let's make this happen. So it's and it took them quite a while, by the way. It's not something that's just going to normally happen. But simply because of the fact that it does exist, another hashing algorithm has been taking over. So the SHA family of hashing is a set of cryptographic hashes, and there's different bit rates for them. So, or bytes, byte lengths, excuse me. So there's 224, 256 is the one that you're going to see most often. And then 512 is the one that you're going to see second most often, and this is the one that's currently taking over. So some malware programs, or excuse me, like antivirus programs, will return an MD5 for everything. But most, for example, Symantec and McAfee both, now return SHA-512. So they give a different type of hash now. This was designed by the NSA. Uh-oh and published in 2001 by the NIST as a U.S. blah, 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 blah. So anyways, this particular hash, which is part of the SHA-2 family, is now taking over. And if you want to read more about it and how it works, ooh, look, there's some math for you. Whee! Then, yeah, have fun with that. Uh, here's a good comparison of SHA functions. So for reference, they throw in the MD5 output size and then a little bit about its inner workings and then whether or not collisions have been found. So check it out right there. I have it highlighted. Let's see if I'm showing that screen properly. Ooh, I am. Good. You see there, security bits. Less than 64 collisions have been found. Whoops. So because of that, the world's moving on. What are they moving on to? Well, they're moving on to the SHA-2 family. SHA-3 technically is, is coming up. I think uh, Bruce Schneider's got some good documentation, actually some phenomenal documentation on SHA stuff. In fact, SHA Bruce. I always smell his I smell. I always spell his last name wrong. There you go. So here you go. Here's a paper I randomly found. Schneider. I can't pronounce his name. I'm horrible with <laughs> names that are uh, with any names really. Or accents. I'm horrible with accents too. So when will we see collisions for SHA one? This guy, by the way, if you're interested in cryptography Go read everything he's ever written. He's considered like the uh, Chuck Norris of cryptography, if you will. And I might be starting some battles with that too, but I mean, hey, it's, come on. The guy's at every single DEF CON giving a talk. He's at every cryptographic conference. He's writ, published some texts, and it, his blog is something you want to watch if you're into cryptography. So anyways, I, in fact, I will take this article from what looks to be October two years ago, and I will put it in our notes right underneath where I talk about collisions. Bam. Okay, cool. So now we have that in our notes. Wonderful. Anyways, so the world's looking to, well, SHA-1, SHA-256, SHA-512. We pretty much standardized on SHA-512, but heck, that may change because SHA-3, uh, look that up. <laughs> it's, it's evolving too fast. Oh, my gosh. All right, so let's have 
some hands-on time here. Okay, I'm going to, I've been talking about hashing for a while now, right? So, again, what's the purpose? You gather digital evidence. You're going to be, you're going to be attacked on, basically attacked on, how'd you gather it? How was it gathered? Was it a standard scope? Was it a targeted thing? Was it all this stuff? The other thing is, like, did you Photoshop it, right? Can you Photoshop a packet capture? You can't literally import it into Photoshop and uh, graphically edit it. Maybe you can. That'd be cool. I don't know. I never tried that. <laughs> now I'm going to go try that. See what Photoshop does with that file type. But anyways, what you can do, of course, is pull packets out and put packets in to a packet capture. Wireshark comes with a suite of utilities. Uh, one's called Edit Cap for editing packet captures. Uh, there's plenty others in the, the binary, you know, the slash bin directory for Wireshark that you install. And when Wireshark installs, it adds its own directory to your path. In Linux, it does not do it in Windows, which is odd. Uh, you can do it yourself, make an environmental, you know, add to your path environmental variable. But anyways, so that you can just run edit cap and the other cap tools. I'm blanking on their names right now. So how do you prove that the data is the original data that you've captured? Well, one of the first things you're supposed to do is hash it. Hash any data you capture whatsoever, so that if it's edited at a later time, that hash will be completely different. Hashing will be 100% different with a single bit change in your input value. So let's take a look and do some live capturing here. I'm going to log into Kali. All right, and in Kali, I have a folder here for session three. Oh, I don't want that yet. Go away. Jumped ahead there. What am I doing? All right, let's 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 do a capture. So we're going to open up Wireshark. Okay, so we have Wireshark. Let's see. Can we? Okay, we have Wireshark open, and I want to start capturing traffic on my loopback. Start. And let's do this. Let's ping my loopback. All right, in standard Linux, the fun stuff, when you do a ping, it just says, okay, I'm just going to keep pinging. <laughs> it's just fun. It just goes and goes and goes. So I didn't specify a number of uh, pings to send. I just wanted some traffic, so I'm done now. I'm going to Control-C out of that, and then I'm going to go stop my network capture. So now I have this network capture. See? Ping, request, reply, request, reply. It's just me pinging myself. See, the source and destinations are the same. That's all it is. That's all it got. But I'm going to save this bad boy. I'm going to save it under, I guess I'll save it under session three. Random PCAP. And I'm going to save it as a PCAP. By the way, there's a PCAP NG is PCAP next generation. They've already changed the format. I don't know anyone in the forensicating or the digital forensic and incident response field known as DFIR, by the way, DFIR. I don't know anyone in this field who's switched to using the NG type. I think we're all too set in our ways, and all of our tools are set to parse standard PCAPs. So I'm just going to save mine as that. And then close up Wireshark. Clear my screen. Go to my session three folder. And here we have random pcap dot pcap. Oh, you see the file details there? Pretty simple. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run md5 sum against that file. So md5 sum very simply provides the message digest 5 hash value for the given file. And there it is. So this is my hash value for this file. If I were to change this file in any way, shape, or form, that hash value would change. So let me show you an example of that. We're going to make a file called edit me. Touch edit me. It exists now. And we're going to vi it. Vi it, excuse me. We're going to insert hello world. And we're going to write and quit. And if I cat edit me, I see it just has the text, hello world. Right? That's all it has. So now what I'm going to do is, you know what? I should probably 
Mm. Yeah, should have done this earlier. Sorry about that. There. Is that easier to see? Yeah, of course it is. Let's do it again. Hey, there we go. Yeah, let's do this. There we go. Okay, should have done that earlier. Sorry about that. Anyways, so as you see, all I've done is I've made a text file, and it just has the, the two words, hello world, in it. I'm going to run an MD5 sum on it, and here's the value. So check this out. We're going to take this. Remember keep note that we talked about the first time? I'm going to make a new page here. Uh, let's call it hash stuff. And there we go. So I have the command. Well, I have what was in the file. I, I did a, a cat on it. And then I have the hash value for the file and these notes. We'll save those notes. All right, now let's just make a very, very minor edit to this file. All right, I'm going to go put a period in it. That's all I've done. And then we're going to write it and view it. Now we're going to MD5 it again. Okay, if you take a look at this and compare it to that, you'll notice that they are night and day. Completely different 32 character hexadecimal values. What's the difference of this file compared to, or I should say that file compared to that file? What's the difference? A period. That's it. That's the only difference. So again, it goes back to chain block encoding where the result of one flows into the next and flows into the next and flows into the next. Any minor change you make, the value is going to be completely different. So, uh, we also have SHA, what is it on Kali? Is SHA 512? So, SHA 512 sum. And we'll do edit me. All right, so we have a much longer sum. Whoops. Let's copy this. Hey, could be weird. There we go. You just have to talk to it. That's all. <laughs> That's the trick. All right, so I have a SHA-512 value now for this particular file, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, you probably guessed it, just edit this sucker, and I'm going to put an extra space in here. So instead of saying hello space world, it's going to say hello space space world. That's all I did. And we're going to run the hash value again. Check that out. Completely different once again. So if you take these guys... Oops, get out of there. There you go. You can see that after I perform my edit, we go from this guy here to this guy here, which is night and day different. So the entire point I'm trying to make here is that it's very important that whenever you capture data, oops, oh, that still shows that. Oh, yeah, because it ends the command. Huh, look at that. Cool. Anyways. Whenever you capture data, you want to run hashes against them. I suggest doing a couple different hashes. Take an MD5 of it, take a SHA-1 of it, take a SHA-256 of it. It's not going to hurt. In fact, when I take a file, it's okay. Let's do something fun here. Let's try something fun. Da, da, da. Let's see. I'm going to go to my root directory. What do we have in here? What's in here? All right, this is not working how I want it. Ignore that. <laughs> I'm going to take a file over on... So I have a different virtual machine running, I think? No, I don't. I made that up. I just want something random that I can grab this. Oh, yeah, let's use that. All right, so I have this hash value for this file, initrd. Let's pretend you don't know what this is. Watch this. We're going to go to virus total. I think we're going to go to virus total. Yeah, there we go. And search. 
File not found. So I still have no idea what that file is. I was expecting that uh, image to have a known hash value. <laughs> Do over. How about this guy? Mm, these will not be in there. Oh, hey, this is what you get when you randomly run DriftNet, which grabs images off the wire completely randomly. You get a uh, Seinfeld representation of uh, different superheroes. <laughs> Some user on our team randomly was looking at this. I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway. Yeah, I don't have any good obvious files to show you. So I don't have anything really loaded on... Linux to show you. So in that case, let's do this. All right, I'm doing stuff in the background here. Give me one moment. I want to see. I wonder if these files will have known hashes. I'm trying to find a file that has a known hash, by the way. So. Some of these might have a known hash. Nah. No. All right, I'm going to, uh, I'm, right now I'm in the background. I'm on my Macintosh computer here, and I'm running MD5, which, by the way, on the Mac, it's just MD5. It's not MD5 sum. And I'm taking an MD5 of the installer for a tool called Bulk Extractor, which is an awesome forensics tool that we may cover in session six. I'm not sure yet. And I'm going to try it looking for that on VirusTotal. Hey, there we go. Check it out. So I took the hash from my computer from the installer that I had in my directory for Bulk Extractor. In fact, it had the exact same file name. You'll notice I searched for the MD5, but up here, see this value up here? VirusTotal even categorizes everything now by its SHA-256. So as I mentioned that we're moving to SHA-512, well, right now VirusTotal it prefers SHA-256. But I found it using the MD5. So if you go over here to additional information and just scroll down, you'll notice it has the MD5, it has the SHA-1, it has the SHA-256. One of the problems with using SHA-512, in fact, one of the main problems right now, is that VirusTotal, which is the end-all, be-all, go-to tool for malware analysis and virus samples, if you will, doesn't support 512 yet. It'll search it if it's like in the comments or something, but that's that's not the purpose of the tool. It's to find out if it's already been analyzed, and so usually SHA-256 is the way to go when dealing with malware or just the good old MD5. But anyways, let's pretend like the file I had on my computer that I just ran a hash on was not labeled, or it was labeled new tool install me.exe. And I was thinking to myself, well, what the heck is that? Why did I tell myself to, like, what? I just go in here, and I would have found out, oh, oh, okay. And if I go over here to file detail, it gives me some more information, and I'm going to digress on analyzing the file specifically, but if I scroll down, you'll see that all the different antivirus vendors, they all have a little green check mark here saying, no, nope, you're good, no virus, no worm, no Trojan, no whatever. So, and it also shows, the, well, this isn't a virus total class, so I'll just, I'll back off that. But anyways, take your hash value, and then you can come check virus total to see if it already exists, if you're looking at software you think might be malicious. But when it comes to your own data that you're capturing, especially like off the wire, just run a few different hashing algorithms against it. Oops, go away. Get out of here. All right, what's next in the class notes? Let's switch our... Oh, yeah, any questions? I only see one student in the chat room. Chat's not working very well. <laughs> or maybe everyone's just watching this after the fact. But... Uh... Yeah, I'm going to say we don't have any questions. Okay. So, let's go back to our notes. Maybe we got the top there. There we go. All right. So, in our notes, the next thing that we have is covert channels. So, so you may have heard the term covert channel before, but 
what I came up with here is a covert channel is a mechanism that utilizes a secretive methodology to transfer data, often using a protocol that is not supposed to be used to transfer data in such a fashion. So, the SANS Institute has a cool little link on covert channels. So let's take a look at that. Close some of these windows here. And switch over to the SANS Institute. There we go. All right. So they have, let me zoom in here. So this is regarding intrusion detection. What is a covert channel and what are some examples? So their definition, a covert channel is a simple yet very effective mechanism for sending and receiving information data between machines without alerting any firewall and or intrusion detection systems on the network. So I won't read the rest of that. You can read this on your own. Basically, I wanted to point you to this article because it's, it's very well written. But also, just to kind of show you that this is something that's being actively researched. Let's see, what year was this particular article written? Oh, there's no year. What? Well, that's silly. Maybe I'm just blind and not seeing it. I don't see an actual publication year. I could check the page source, but I'm already over it. So, meh. A covert channel, and if we look up Wikipedia... is simply using a channel that's not typically used to provide a certain type of information to provide a different type of information. So let me give you an example. Uh, we'll start with weaker examples and then grow a little stronger. A covert channel that was used during the Cold War, and I, I'm pretty sure still used today, is uh, radio station towers, right? A radio station tower is used to broadcast a radio signal. Well, one of the radio stations, well, many different radio stations, and there's an entire movement and a huge subculture. It's like a cult following that this particular stuff has. Uh, but the Russian spy towers, in fact, I wonder. Yeah, here you go. That's an invite. A number station. There we go. So a number station is a type of shortwave radio station characterized by unusual broadcasts reading out lists of numbers or incomprehensible Morse code messages. So the Ruskies used to send cool messages back and forth to one another over standard radio towers. Now, they would broadcast at a certain frequency that most people would not be tapping into, but if you tapped into that frequency, all you would hear is incomprehensible Morse code messages or just basically a series of bloops and bleeps and blah, 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 blahs. So these, what did I say Cold War? When was this? World War II. Okay. Way off. I'm not a history buff, by the way. <laughs> Anyone who's into history just cringed right now, confusing those two slightly different significant events <laughs> in our history. Whatever. So anyways, uh, this guy goes over the, this article goes over the use of these number stations, and you'll see that the uh, those are not standard necessarily um, for at least what you're considering like radio, FM, AM stuff. Yeah, anyways, uh, so the number stations would send out these random weird blips and bloops, and people would tap into it, and a lot of times people would, uh, like at first, they'd probably just think, oh, this is you know, bad connection, bad station, or I'm out of the distance, or uh, something silly, right? But really, they're just covertly using that radio station to broadcast some type of encoded message. Uh, a simple example would be, I used to have a friend who was really into ham radios. So if anyone here is a, a ham person, uh, uh, props to you, because that stuff's pretty cool. But what he used to do is he would digitize a lot of stuff on his old Commodore computer into these random blips and bloops, and then he would send it over his ham radio to his buddy, and he thought he was really cool because he was like, yeah, it's like a covert channel, you know? Someone could be listening on another ham radio, but they have no idea what I'm saying right now. So in the digital age, what we have to deal with as far as covert channels involves something like the following. This is a paper I found this, I don't know, I think yesterday. Covert channel over ICMP. So, ICMP is used for ping. If you're familiar with the Packet Internet Groper, 
uh, Internet Control Messaging Protocol, ICMP Echo 8 Request is a ping. So you're probably all familiar with sending a ping out, right? You send a ping, you get a response if the device is up, and for that matter, if it's accepting ping traffic. So in here, we have some fun stuff, and here's a little screenshot. Let me just zoom in a little. Oh, yeah, there we go. So here's a ping, and it uh, looks like KDE there with the console running. Make sure I'm sharing this out. I am. Cool. And then down here, we see a Wireshark view of the ping, and it's just like we saw earlier when I captured my traffic and so that I could hash it. Remember, I just did, it had some pings and pongs in there. Okay, well, so here's the thing. You can send a ping with zero bytes of data. You can change the size of the data that ping is sending. Now, the fun part is you can also inject data into the payload structure of the ping itself. This article goes over how to do it. So without getting into the essence of this article, because that, that's outside the scope of what we're doing here, certain tools, like this guy right here, HPing2, which is freaking awesome, you can encode data inside of a ping. So in this example here, if you can see my mouse here, they're at the very top, they're using HPing2 to include the letters AAAA capital A four times in a ping. Now the funny thing is, on the other side, unless you're looking for this, you're literally just going to see a ping and you're going to respond with a pong. Uh, you, by the way, would be a, uh, a computer system. <laughs> you're not at the network card le level, so <laughs> whatever. But he basically Pythonized something here so that you could include more data in your pings. And for that matter, you can include data split up over multiple pings so that on the other side they think they're just getting pinged maybe 30 times by a remote host, maybe for connectivity testing, but really you're sending data. And other tools on the other side can then decipher that data. So that's a covert channel because you're sending regular looking pings, but really you're sending data encoded within. So that's what a covert channel is all about, and we're going to somewhat tap into kind of the idea of covert channels as we move into reviewing the session two assignment. Let's do that now. Let's change the screen. Okay, so for, I guess you can say homework, for the assignment, for the challenge, we had levels three and four. Let's take a look at level three. I have the whole thing written up. In fact, one of the students, one of you, sent me a message asking for some tips. And I provided some tips and then realized, oh, this is perfect for our Word document. So that happened. So let's just open up level three and let's go through it. Now, everything that I'm going to cover is in the Word document. I'm pointing at my computer because I have it up over here. But you can follow along with that, follow along with me, both, whatever. Let's switch over my screen now. We're going to move to back to Kali Linux. There we go. All right, make sure I'm sharing it. Yeah, okay, cool. Hello. There we go. All right, and level three, I'm going to open the HTML file. Zoom in. Level three, Gregory is hesitant to meet with the mysterious Betty. While working late in the office, Gregory hears his phone ring. He checks his phone. He soon realizes that he has no choice but to attend the meeting with Betty. So you are to use the level three packet capture to answer the following question. What will Gregory die from if he fails to meet with Betty? So it looks like Betty is doing a little threatening over here. So we open up the level three PCAP. Double click. Now, I'm not just going to jump right to the answer. I'm going to show you some standard analysis that you would use in these types of situations to find something like the hints that you've been provided. So we're going to work through it in that type of fashion. The Word document goes directly into the answer, but I'm going to do a little more than that right now. So I have my notepad open for level four notes, and there's nothing there. See? Delete that. Let's take a look here. We want to reopen the HTML file. And as you remember from one of the sessions, I think session two, I talked about taking notes. 
So first off, you might just want to literally have the entire thing. And then down here, you're going to want to have your key list. Keyword list, excuse me. So Gregory, Betty, maybe Office, but I don't think that has to do much with what he's talking about. Uh, phone. Hopefully those are the main things. And then here, seem really no choice but to attend the meeting. And then Betty again. And what will Gregory die from? So die is a good one. If he fails to meet with Betty. All right, this would be my original list. And if you go into level 3 PCAP and you start looking for these by just doing a control F, which, by the way, is the same as going to edit find packet. See right there, control F. And then to find data inside the packet itself, don't forget that you change this to string, and then you look in the packet bytes themselves. So let's type in Betty, and leave case sensitive off so that you don't have to worry about case sensitivity. I search for Betty, nothing. Down here at the bottom left-hand side, by the way, it tells you, you know, what's going on. So. So, hey, I converted that to ASCII. I didn't find it in the entire packet. Okay, didn't find Betty. What about Gregory? Nothing. All right, office, phone, die, meet. Office? Hey, there's something. What's this? Uh, probably just a reference to an office file or something. Let's see here. Hey, look at this. What is this? Da, 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 da. We have a git request for, I think this is just a standard image hoster, I believe. And the ATT device ID is that Huayu? Huay? How's that pronounced? <laughs> I told you guys I, I can't pronounce names like that. So if you go Google this, you're going to find out that this is an AT&T Fusion 2 cell phone. So someone's using a cell phone. Okay. Now, what did I just say? Someone is using a what? Someone's using a cell phone. Remember our initial thing up here? Gregory hears his, his what? His phone ring. And then we notice, just randomly, we find this, which, by the way, is a, just a, a JPEG file, if you remember from last time, see? It's a JPEG being transferred down. But transferring a JPEG on his, or excuse me, on a phone. We don't know if this is Gregory's, but, I mean, if you put two and two together, you might think that's his phone. So here's something we'll do. We'll take this and go to our notes and... Put it in there. And then you would literally take this right here, and let's just say go to Google, and search for it. And what do you find? Well, you find pictures of it. And the first thing you see is AT&T Fusion 2, and the model number support from AT&T.com. Here's a good place to go. So you know it's an AT&T Fusion 2. So in heck, you can even take this. There you go. So you know that this traffic has some uh, traffic where the client is an AT&T Fusion 2 phone. Okay. And if I scroll up and down this, I see that here's a bunch of JavaScript, and I, yeah, whatever. Let's see, does Office even come up in this? No, it doesn't. So it's just part of the packet decoded. I didn't see anything there that looked obvious to me. So anyways, you could struggle through this and keep searching for stuff. But I'll tell you what, you're not going to find it that way. So if you remember, one of the first things I said you should do really is get a feel for what you're dealing with. So I go right here to Statistics, Summary. And when I go to the Summary, I see when the capture was taken. And I see how many packets are in it, 5,705. Cool. So now what I really care about is the protocol hierarchy. 
Oh, you know what? I'm sorry. Hold on. I, I apologize. Let's go to end points first. No Ethernet endpoints. How about IPv4? Sort by address. In fact, sort by bytes. What's doing the most communicating? The device doing most of the communicating, the devices doing most of the communicating, are these three right here. Now, technically, I can go look them up if I wanted to, but I'm, I'm not going to do all that. So, but these are just important for like traffic filtering. I can filter on one of these and try to see if maybe that particular device is doing a lot of transfer or something along those lines. But no Ethernet endpoints. Well, that's sad. What about conversations? Again, no Ethernet. What about IPv4? Let's go to bytes, total bytes, and here's what we have the most traffic. We have A going to B. We have a 10.90. In fact, check this out. All the IPv4 conversations include this 1092.182.35. So there's something to that. And then they're going to be, and the most packets slash bytes went out to 173, 194, 24.118. Let's try to filter on this. I actually have not done this yet, so let's, let's see how this works. Let's filter. Um, well, let's take a look here. What's most of the traffic? Bytes. B to A is the most. B to A has the most packets here. So let's filter. Selected. B to A. Let's see what we get. All right. I have some stuff. What is this? I don't know. Let's find out. Follow TCP stream. Git video playback slash da 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 da. If you look here, it looks like a YouTube video. So that's pretty simple, actually. So the device goes out to YouTube. YouTube then sends back what looks to be a video. Looks to be a video because I see the file type here, and this is telling me it's a video. And here's some additional indicators. This is a video. I could carve this video out if I wanted to, but I don't because it's just a YouTube video. Then again, maybe I do, right? Well, I don't know. What am I looking for? I have no idea. Well, right now, I have no reason to think that I need to look at a YouTube video. I could have reason. I could hunt that down. I could pull it out, but eh, not right now. So what I really want to go to is protocol hierarchy. And in here, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for everything. It's not very long. Look, I mean, we almost can fit the entire thing on one screen. In fact, if I just take frame out of the picture and scroll down, we see all the different types of protocols that are involved in this traffic. Everything here is right here. So IPv4, TCP, SSL, hypertext, what's that? It's MMS message encapsulation. MMS, what's that? Well, let's come back to that in a moment. Line-based text data. What's that? That's just silliness is what that is. Media type, JavaScript, or SSL. Good luck with SSL stuff without certs. ENG files, graphics, you know, pictures. Hypertext, transfer, some JPEGs, some XML, yada, yada, yada. And then UDP for domain name. See, all you can tell here that all UDP traffic is domain uh, name service lookups. Because when you look under packets, you have 34 packets, and then for domain name service, you have 34 packets, which tells you, hey, all the UDP is DNS. So what do I want to focus on? Well, I know that he's dealing with what? A phone. Remember? It says phone twice up here. His phone rang. Checks his phone. In the traffic, I randomly identified that someone is using an AT&T Fusion 2 phone. So when I go back over here, if you're not familiar with the protocol, look it up. I'm going to filter on MMS message encapsulation. But before I filter on that, let's say you didn't know what that was. So hopefully you would look it up. MMSE.
All right, let's do a better Google search. MMS encapsulation. There you go. Hey, look, we even find an article from Wireshark. .org. That doesn't hurt at all. What's this say? The Multimedia Messaging Service, MMS, allows a person to send and receive self-contained multimedia messages. Wait a minute. The MMS service can be compared with the email service where the message consists of a series of attachments. Ooh. Now, anyways, if you're not familiar with MMS, it's what you use to send multimedia files on cell phones. So let me put this that I just found. I didn't have this in our notes yet. I just found this, so... Cool. Let's do it. Right there. All right. Back of the show. All right. So, multimedia, huh? Okay. So, what do we have here? Well, for protocol, we have MMSE slash SMIL. And then, check this out. MMS M-send request media slash MP4. Wait a minute. So we have, and hey, look at this. It is our our heavy talker, by the way. This guy right here, the 1092.182.35. And we see send confirmation. So send request and send confirmation. What? Now another thing I want to point out is look at this Wireshark filter. When I did the filter using the protocol hierarchy, when I went like this, when I chose that, the filter that I got was this. MMSE and HTTP and TCP and IP and SSL and frame. Wow, that's awesome. Watch this. MMSE. Boom, same thing. So Wireshark will be really, really verbose. So not just verbose, but really, really verbose. When you apply a filter using it, but when you just type your own, I mean, there you go. You can filter on MMSE. So what's going on here? Well, we can do the breakdown and look here. So it's, heck, this is a cyber forensics course, right? So the frame itself, do I care about the frame? No, I sure don't. Linux cooked capture. Ooh, it's a cooked capture. What's that mean? Go look it up. Internet protocol version 4. Cool. This will show our source and destination. Okay, cool. And then TCP, and this will show our port numbers. Okay, so source port 44161, which is a, uh, what, is it, what are those called? Uh, non-standard, it's an ephemeral port. It's one of the, what is it called? Not registered ports is what I'm looking for. Destination port 80, because it's going through a certain type of gateway that uses port 80 there. Mm, anyway, and then down here, I have hypertext transfer protocol. And check this out. I have a post to mmsc.singular.com. And then the device ID, hey, look at that. Remember this? We've seen this. This is an AT&T Fusion 2. All right. By the way, AT&T bought Singular back in like 2009 or 10 or something. Uh, Stephen Colbert has a hilarious video involving AT&T and Singular. Uh, look for that when you have a chance. It's pretty funny. So anyways, um, the accept is WAP MMS message. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> And, yeah, that's enough for that. And then down here, we have the MMS message details. So, send request, MMS protocol version, whatever. The content, smil.xml. So, there's some type of XML data being transferred. And the data itself, multi-part body. Part 1, application smil. Part 2, content type. Video slash MPEG-4. Wait a minute. Check it out. Content, video, MP4, name, vid, underscore, 2013, July 5th. And I, that's probably a time or something. Is that how many numbers there? Yeah, it's probably a time. And then here's the name of it. Headers. Just the name. Media type. Video MP4, 139 kilobytes. 139,505 bytes. Say what? Okay. So we have a video being sent via MMS. Ooh. 
How do we get this video? Well, there are multiple ways to get this video, but I'm going to go over a very common way to do it. I'm going to talk about file carving here. So we're going to right click and we're going to follow TCP stream, which by the way, will then provide to us the same information we just saw, right? In fact, here is the smil.xml and this XML, what is SMIL.XML? Is that a thing? Like, what is that? Well, I don't know. Let's look. Hey, check it out. It's actually a thing. So, I'm going to be 100% honest here. I had no idea this was a thing until I just realized I should look this up right now. <laughs> I thought it was actually short for smile.xml. I thought the person was sending it a smile. So, yeah, that whole thing about competing and, and messing with packet captures and, and communicating with other people and learning a lot all the time, here you go. I just learned something new. Synchronized Multimedia Integration Language. Okay. It's an XML-based markup language to describe multimedia presentations. Cool. I had no idea. So, awesome. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. Sure. Let's put this in our notes. That's kind of cool. I had no idea. All right. Cool. Cool beans. Okay, anyway, so we have this smile, <laughs> the smil.xml. And then what else do we see here? Oh, there's a video source. Okay. And then duration. How many milliseconds long is the video? And then all of a sudden, after the XML stuff ends, we have this stuff. What's this? And I scroll down. Looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. Well, yeah, it's because it's video content, which is compressed, so you're going to have a high level of entropy. If you remember last session, we talked about entropy. And then down at the bottom, we have the response. Message accepted. Cool. So what do we do with it? I need the video. I want it. I want it. How do I get it? We're going to carve it out. Down at the bottom, we're looking at the entire conversation right now. I can look, however, at different sides of the conversation. So let's say I just look at the side that's sending data to our heavy talker. It's only 147 bytes. What is it? It's just the 200 OK and the message accepted. That's all it is. Going through a WAP MMS gateway. If you're not familiar with WAP, it's what cell phones use for MMS gateway stuff. So look that up later. If you want. Yeah. So this is the reply. Well, I don't care about the reply. I want the video. So I go over here to this part. Bam, there we go. So everything here, I think this text, pretty sure it's red. Again, I don't know colors, but it's normally red and blue, so I'm going to say this is red. So I want to save this. How do I save it? Well, down at the bottom left, I have a big button that says Save As. Cool. All right, and I want to save it as level 4 dot bin for binary or level 4 dot blob or level 4 dot whatever or anything. It doesn't matter what you name it because we just have a blob of text right now. So typically I we use bin in the field for binary data that doesn't have an actual type at this point. And then I'm going to minimize and close and close and minimize and close. Um, yeah, close them all. So I have this file now, level3.bin. Okay, what do I do with it? Well, I want to look at it in a hex editor. In Kali, I have installed what's called bless. You literally just run apt-get install bless. I mentioned that, I think, session one or two? One of them. So when you run bless, you then go to open, and I can go to, oh, there it is. It's already in my recent files, level 4 bin, and you open it. What's in it? This stuff. All right, by the way, I don't want to throw you off because I'm using bless. So if you're using any other hex editor, I don't care what it is, just open the file. Level 4 dot bin is what I named mine. Whatever you named yours, just, you know, open it in a hex editor. It doesn't matter what you actually are using. They all do the same stuff. I would switch over to Windows and use like HXD or something like that, but I want to keep everything in Cali for today, so I'm just going to do this. 
Okay, now the data over here is the hexadecimal representation. And then over here we have the ASCII representation of our data. So again, we see the post value, we see our AT&T phone, and if you scroll down to this area here, you see where the SMIL document stuff ends, and we have some stuff about the video. So I know that I have an MP4 file, and I want it. I want it. How do I get it? I carve it out. So do you remember about file carving? We talked about this before. I'm going to go over here to Google and search for file signatures. And it takes me to Gary Kessler's site. This is not the only site you have to use in the world, but I just, I love his site. So I'll open that in the new tab. This one's also fairly good, filesignatures.net. So I want to search by the extension or the signature itself. I want to search by extension, MP4. Submit. No results found. Well, okay. What? Really? Get out of here. All right, all signatures. Search. MP4. MPEG. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there you go. And on Gary Kessler's site, if I do a search for MP4, bam. On the file signature database, if I do a search for MP4, I get nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why not? Well, I don't know. They just didn't include it in their, uh, what's this field name, description. I think that's a bit silly that you can't search by that particular extension, but whatever. They're saying the extension here is 3GP5, and I got that by just clicking on it. And it says it's going to be an MPEG-4. And the ASCII will have some dots and then FTYP. And the signature is three sets of zeros and then 18, 66, 74, 79, 70. That's known as the magic number or as the file header in our case. So are we dealing with a 3GP5 phone? Or, sorry, I, I just gave that away. A 3GP5 type of file signature that happens to be MPEG-4? Well, let's go look at Gary Kessler's site. When I search for MP4 here, I get a different value. It's not 14, it's not, oh wait, was it the one? I already forgot. It's not 1866. This one shows me 1466 for an MP4. But hold on, if I search for MP4 again, oh hey, look at that one. There's the same one. Kessler's site has multiple values for MPEG-4. In fact, there's more. There's one down here for MP, MPEG-4, motion picture, no, what is that? Moving pictures expert group or something like that. Uh, and layer four encoding video file, and this one's different. I don't remember seeing MSNV in the file, but uh, let's keep looking. What else do we have? Well, there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one. So his site is very easy. You just search by the extension, and you find a bunch of stuff, or you search by what you see in the file itself. I saw MP4. For that matter, I also saw, let's go back to it. I also see this right here, FTYP. So if I didn't know what the heck I was looking for, I searched for FTYP and nope, nothing there. What about signature? Nope, nothing there. All right. Maybe that site's not that great. <laughs> Search by FTYP here, and I find all kinds of stuff. So yeah, this is an example of why I like Gary Kessler's site. So anyway, all right, let's go back to this site, and uh, I think I searched for MPEG. No? What did I do? Oh, look at you. How about this? No? Oh, goodness. I just forgot how I found this. MP4? MP4? I could have swore. What? I went to all signatures and did a control F. That's what I did. Weird. Uh, anyway. All right, maybe it's this signature. Three sets of zeros, 18, 66, 74, 79, 70. Let's do this. Where did I get my file signature? Here. And what is the file signature that I found? It might be for this type of video that we're dealing with. May or may not be. I don't know. It's okay. So oh, let's see if I have this. Three zeros, 1866.74. Start at the very top. And you can just do a search. Search. Find. Three zeros. 
Hey, I found something. I found four sets of zeros. 18, 66, 74, 79, 70. That's it. 66, 74, 79, 70. Bam. So we are actually dealing with a 3GP5 file type. Okay. What's that? Oh, oh look. <laughs> it takes me to that site. That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah. Well, it's version 5 probably. It's just it's this 3GP video, so there's a link on it here. 3GP is a multimedia container format defined by the third generation partnership group, or excuse me, partnership project, hence the term 3GPP, for 3G multimedia devices. Hey, it's mobile phone video stuff. Okay, cool. Let's put this in our notes. So far it seems like we're on the right track, right? All right, we found the signature, so what do we do? Well, we cut it out. Now, I have four sets of zeros before the, the 18, but this site tells me there should be only three. So I say, okay, and I take the rest out, and I delete it. Oops. One, two, three, yeah, there we go. All right. So now my file starts with three, zero, three sets of zeros, 18, 66, 74, 79, 70. File, save, not enough free space on the device. What? Uh, where am I saving to? Well, that, that makes no, absolutely no sense. Uh, do over? Desktop. Okay. Just ignore that error, please. No idea what's going on there. And you go away, and you go away. All right. So I moved it. I just called it level4.bin again. But I think this is a video, so I'm going to go change the name to MP4. All right. So the operating system recognizes the fact that it, it well, that the extension is MP4. And we double click. Hey, what's this? It says top secret, and then I'll pause it right there. And then you see someone holding a pen pointing to a picture from an old game called The Oregon Trail. If you've never played that game, you should go play it. It's one of the best games of all time. And it says you have died of dysentery. <laughs> Nasty. And then it zooms in to dysentery. So the whole you have died of dysentery thing is very popular among the, the internet crowd because of that game. But that's the answer to what we're trying to solve. So how's he going to die? Well, he was sent something on his phone. We found AT&T Fusion 2 phone traffic. We then noticed the MMSE traffic. We took the MMSE traffic, we followed the TCP stream. We took just one side of the conversation, we saved it, we noticed that we had this stuff here, there was an MP4 video, we could have just searched this by the way, in fact we could have searched that also, see here's 3GP again. So there's multiple ways to find it's an MP4 file, opened it in a hex editor, carved it out and we got the video, so that's the answer he would have died of dysentery. All right. Cool. Move that in there. Wait a minute. Level four? No, this is level three. I'm sorry. Just confused myself. All right. Anyone who watches that video earlier is going to be like, wait, what? <laughs> That's level three, man. Yeah, sorry. Level three. Level three. All right. Next up on our list is level four. We're going to go through level four now. So, what did level four say? Level four, oh, I'm sorry, are there any questions? I only see still one person technically even on Skype, so I'm going to think we don't have any questions. Yep, looks like people are using this class a little more asynchronously than I thought, so that's fine. Perfectly fine. Level four. 
and zoom in. Okay, Gregory, still unsure of Betty's true identity, meets with a group identifying themselves as Betty's associates. They gave him a list of demands, including numbers to bank accounts and additional secret documents. Betty's associates told Gregory that he will be provided with information regarding the delivery of the goods. What goods? I don't know. Use the level 4 packet capture to answer the following question. Betty's associates provided a password to Gregory. What is the password? Okay. So, let's see. I, I, something's nagging me here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me add the level 4 file real quick here. I'm in my other operating system, so just give me a moment. I am copying over the level 4 PCAP and HTML since we previously only had the TrueCrypt volume. So let me do that now. Challenge level 4 PCAP and HTML. Copy. Okay. By the time you're watching this after the recording, those files will be available to you. And if you're following along now, they'll be up shortly. Upload's going a bit slow because I'm streaming. Well, whatever. I'll be done in 30 seconds or a minute. Okay. So going back. All right. Let's start off the same way we've done before. In fact, look, I've been doing this thing. I've been taking level four notes the whole time. That's just silly. Level three notes. I'm pretty sure I threw some people off with that, but whoops. I'll put a note. Well, let, me, let me make a note for myself to annotate the video. Annotate the video and mention... Level three. Silly. That's a silly mistake. All right. New page. Now we're actually on level four. Level four notes. And as a note, I put down here, you don't need to go back to any previous round to answer this round. Just focus on the level four PCAP, okay? So I, in this particular challenge, you don't need to go back. You're just going forward. Just use the current round to answer stuff. Alrighty, and we have this, and let's see, let's just copy, I just like doing this to find keywords, right, so we still have Gregory, we have, whoops, we have Betty, meet, group, associates, List, numbers, bank, counts, secret, documents. And tell them to provide with information regarding the, oh, we got delivery, goods. And then use level four packet capture to answer the following question. Provided a, whoop, there's a big one, password to Gregory. What is the password? Okay, there's my keyword list. Now, here's the thing. Out of all these suckers right here, out of all these keywords I just generated, what's the first one I want to look for? Password. I mean, what am I trying to find? Betty's associates provided a password to Gregory. What is the password? Well, I want the password, so I'm going to look for that first. So level four PCAP, open it up. There it is. All right, how long is this guy? This, how many packets are in here? Oh, 17,000, all right, so it's decent size. So I do a control F, string, packet bytes, password, find. Yeah, I found something, check it out. That's easy. Okay. Uh, Let's look at the bottom part down here. Let's scroll up just a tad. Hey, look. You know the location and password for the drop blah, 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 blah. So we're going to have a little fun right now. This stumped me for all of 10 minutes before I realized that in session two, we covered something that is vitally important, and we're going to bring it up right now, and this is just happenstance, but pretty freaking awesome that it happens. 
So I have in frame number 7728, I have this data down here with the word password. This is URL encoded, by the way. See this 20%? Percent, excuse me, percent 20. That's a space in HTML encoding. So I have this. I want this. It has the word password in it, and it's like a message of some sort. And it says AOL.com. Like, what is this? Is this email? Cool. So I right-click, follow TCP stream. You ready for this? Watch what happens. I get TCP stream equals 7. And look, it starts at frame 7728. Well, it doesn't start at frame 7728, but frame 7728 is part of it. All right? Okay, perfect. So when I follow the stream, what do I get? I get a post to AOL using, looks like Firefox. An old, a really old version of Firefox, like 32 or 33 right now? 13, awesome. And what is this? Well, looks like AOL email to me. But I can scroll up and down here. That message that I found is nowhere in here. Why not? Well, I don't know. I cannot answer that question. I, I, can, I cannot technically answer the question, but I can tell you what's happening if that makes any sense. So AOL email is XML formatted. It does this XML HTTP request and it re retrieves the AOL email. Wireshark has been able to decode AOL email for I don't know how freaking long now. Uh, so, and you see down here, references to mail.aol.com. So here's my confusion. I see nothing in this entire message here that I see down here. So what's going on? Look, there's there's an entire message in here. If I scroll down, let's see, we have some HTML. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Uh, you made it. We should see a concert. Okay, what? There, I want this message. I, I want it. How do I get it? Well, I'm confused right now because what I should be able to do is follow TCP stream. That is supposed to work, and it's not working. Why not? I don't technically know. But here's what I do know. I can still get it. If I look down here, I see the data that I want, right? All right, well, let me just copy it. Edit, copy. I don't want the description. I don't want the field name. I want the value. So I copy the value. That's what I got. Wonderful. What is this? Anyone recognize? You better recognize. It's hexadecimal. This version of Wireshark won't let me copy the ASCII. The value that it wants to copy is just down here in the hex. Well, that's annoying. What about down here? Can I change this? Well, that's just on the one packet. Well, that's, that's silly. I want this stuff down here. Decodes TCP and nothing above it. What? Why are you doing that? I don't know. I don't know why it does. It's this, this, is, uh, this is wonky is officially what this is. So weird, huh? Let's, let's take a look at something up here. Let's look at the very top. I'm running Kali Linux 1.0.6, 64-bit version. This had installed in it. Wireshark 1.10.2 and then SVN revision 51.93.4 from trunk 1.10 because it's 1.10.2. SVN is a version control application that's being completely taken over by Git, by the way, but I'll, I'll digress on that. Uh, so anyways, this is 1.10.2. It's not letting me copy this. It's not letting me decode this. Fine. I don't need you. It let me copy the hex, right? We've done this before. I'm going to do a replace, and I'm going to replace all these colons because I, I don't want them. Replace all at once. Replace. It's going to take a moment because there's quite a few of them. Any text editor will allow you to do this, by the way, unless mine crashes. Cool. 2719 replaced. Awesome. Copy. Python.
He code the hex in Python. How? You provide the string dot decode hex. We've done this before. Remember this? Yeah. Or, by the way, or I could simply take this and I could put it in some type of online translator. So, heck, let's do that. Let's say that you're not comfortable with Python for whatever reason. Let's do this. X to ASCII. I'm just going to do a regular search here. What's this? This site looks more complicated than I would expect. Uh, no, no. Yes. Paste, convert. Oh, cool. There we go. Here's my text. Awesome. And there we go. How about Rod Stewart, blah, blah, yada, yada, blah, blah. You'll notice it's still URL encoded. Percent 20 is a space. So I need to un-URL encode this bad boy. I wonder if this tool, hey, look at this. This tool actually takes, this is handy. What is this? Ask it at hex.com. I like this. I'm going to put this in our notes. Ain't this something? Ain't this something? All right, check it out. I just decoded it. It gave me the text. And then look down here. It already put it in this box down here. I wonder if this works. Convert. Oh, maybe not. Uh, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> I thought it was going to work. Oh, well, wait a minute. You are all encoded. Yeah, that's you are all encoded. So decode it, buddy. Convert. Mm, not so much. Hmm. What's silly? Let's try something else here. URL decode encoder. Decode. That's not doing the best job in the world, but I'll take it. For example, that's URL for space. That's HTML. Sorry. No, no, that's URL encoder for space. What the heck? All right, let's clean it up even more. Let me review real quick because I went kind of fast there. So what did I do? I don't even know. What, what did I just do? Okay, I copied this by going to edit, copy, value, which gave me hex. I then went into leafpad, any text editor will do, and I have replaced all the colons. I then went into Python, and I just put the string dot decode hex. That's all I did, just, just that guy right there. And then I got this, which is URL encoded. I also did the same thing using that online utility that I already forgot the name of, ASCII to hex.com. So I went over here, and I put it into hex desk. Whoops, wrong version. Well, anyways, I put it in hex decimal, and then it, it gave me this URL encoded thing. And then I went here to the URL encoder decoder, and I hit decode. And then I got this. This is still not exactly what I would like. So let's take this into leafpad. All right, so what's annoying me is this right here. This is actually supposed to be a space, and slash in is supposed to be a, an, uh, a carriage return. Or excuse me, a new line. Technically, it's a new line. Um, so I want to replace these, and I want to replace the other one. So here we go. Let's do a replace. Replace what? I want to replace in. Oh, you know what? I'm not sure this is going to work in LeafPad. Yeah, that doesn't work in LeafPad. Uh, LeafPad's a bit, a bit trivial for this. Well, I can at least do these. I want to replace these with a space. There we go. All right. And then I want to replace this new line with an actual new line. So you can do this in Python. I'm just going to cheat right now, and I'm going to go over to my other hex editor that you can't see right now. And I'm going to do this. All right, I cheated. All I did was I replaced the slash in with a carriage return new line. That's all I did. So if you have a good text editor, you can do that. But anyway, check it out. What do I get now? Ooh, a little, little more something attuned to what I would like to see here. It's an email from Betty Swindle at AOL.com. <laughs> Swindle, that's funny. To deathmerchant at AOL.com. Subject. Dinner and a show. Cool. 
And then we have some standard HTML, and it's just text formatting. And then here we have our message that's encoded. I'm so happy you made it. In fact, here, I'll just do this so we can see it better. There you go. I'm so happy you made it. We should see a concert. How about Rod Stewart, The Hits? Second mezzanine, section four, row H, seat 410. You know the location and the password for the drop. That's why we found this, by the way, because I just searched for the word password. We should get dinner afterwards. Okay, now I'm confused. You should know the password for the drop. Dang it. I don't know the password. That's what I'm trying to find. But look down here. Oh, and then she signs it, Betty. BR is just HTML for break. It just means go down a line. So, but what's this? What's going on over here? I have XML version, KML, and then OpenGIST.net KML22, document, secret.kml, and then I don't have anything else. What the heck's a KML? Let's find out. KML file. Keyhole markup language is an XML-based file format, that's what we just saw, used to display geographic data in an Earth browser such as Google Earth Maps, Maps for Mobile, etc. With KML, you can display pretty much everything on a map. So, wait a minute. What's going on here? It looks like Betty sent Death Merchant, who, by the way, is Greg, since she addresses him as, Hey, Greg. Was that the subject? or No, that's just the top of the email. Yeah, she starts it off with, hey, Greg. So, hey, Greg, and then she, the attachment is secret.kml. Okay, so we were able to decode all that. Did Wireshark help us a whole lot? Eh, it helped. I found the word password in there, but it didn't show me any of that stuff, so thanks a lot, Wireshark. I really appreciate that bunch of junk. So what about this? What if I search for... KML. Right click, follow stream. Look at this. It does the same freaking thing. The information I want, not available to me. Same stream, by the way. All right, let's try it again. KML. Here's a post to AOL KML. Look at this. Same freaking thing. What? That's annoying. What's going on here? What? What about this? What about last session I talked about the importance of dual tool verification. This is, I, I'm telling you, this is literally just happenstance. I did not plan this, all right? But we have a packet capture with an email that Wireshark is not properly parsing. There's an attachment to this email called secret.kml. I want that attachment. I need that. I'm using Wireshark 1.10.2. Okay. Uh, what if I try this? What if I try to update Wireshark? I was actually going to try something else, but I just thought of this. This can't hurt. Update. Or a shark. Oh, I made up update. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong tool. I'm doing everything wrong. Hold on. <laughs> failing. What is the freaking... Oh, it's already the newest version anyway. Whatever. That's me failing at apt-get. Sorry, everyone. So, I already have the newest version. That's weird, right? What's going on? Let's try something else now. Hey, hi again. So we have an email with a KML file called secret.kml. It's even in camel case, like upper and lower case. So I, it's like so it's super secret, right? I need that file. But Wireshark's failing me. So how do I get that file? Let's try a different operating system. Let's try a different version of Wireshark. Remember I said last time it's very helpful to use multiple versions of tools? I'm going to open up. Mm, I'll use this. 
I have a copy of Windows XP Service Pack 3 that I use for malware analysis. And we're going to use that right now to see what Wireshark's doing. Okay, cool. Yeah, there it is. All right, check it out. So, just regular old Windows XP, okay? And I have Wireshark here. Let's open Wireshark. What version is this running? This is running version 1.6.5. Oh, wow, that's old. That's pretty darn old. It is definitely not 1.10. So, much older. Well, let's see what we have here. Let's open up Level 4 PCAT. And let's do a Control F. We're in Windows now, so we go string, packet bytes, password, find, and look, there's the info again. Right click, follow TCP stream. Well, what in the heck is this? Oh, look, I have a completely, completely different view with a lot more data. That's cute. Why? What's happening here? I don't know, but it looks like someone needs to file a bug report with Wireshark. I found this last night. I was actually laughing pretty hard. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I just found a bug in Wireshark. <laughs> what the heck? That is the newest version of Wireshark, and it does not parse this correctly. This is a version from I don't even know when. And look, check this out. Wait a minute. Here's the email. Requests. Swindy, how about the drop, blah, blah, yada, yada, blah, blah, yada, yada. And down here, what's going on with all this? There's stuff in here. What is this? What? Anyone know what these are? Let me give you a hint. Anyone knows what that is? Anyone familiar with latitude and longitude? This is why I brought up covert channels. I don't know if this technically falls under the dictionary description or definition of a covert channel, but when I see an email that has a boatload of latitude and longitude coordinates, I find that to be odd. I want to find out more about this. What's going on with this? There's a lot of these in here. So down at the bottom, we have this part. So I can take all this data here, all this up here. Da, 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 da. All right, and it starts off like that. Copy, close. Does this have internet access? One moment. No, it doesn't. Well, it's because it's my malware VM. I don't want it to have internet access. Yeah, hold on. Uh, let me do something else here. Uh, yeah, go away. OK, paste. All right, I am going to change stuff. Oh, heck, I'll just give this thing internet access. All right, I reverted to a snapshot where I'm not running any malware, so should be all right. All right, hold on. Getting internet access for this machine. Have it by now. Do I even have a... I don't think I have anything except for Internet Explorer on here because I normally don't use the internet on this little guy. I wonder if there's a, uh, you know, I might have set a weird proxy for some type of analysis too. Nope. May have messed up my host file too. Limited or no connectivity. Really, bro? Well, I don't want to, oh, okay, there it goes. All right. So anyways, I got, what are we dealing with here? Internet Explorer 8. <laughs> nice. What year is that? So I have this URL encoded, by the way, percent %22, percent %2C. This is all URL encoding stuff. So I need to URL encode. Oh, look at that. It's a pretty good tool. All right, and I want to, oops, I want to decode this. Hey, look at this. I got some stuff. Hmm. I take this. Do I have Notepad++ on here? I hope I do. Oh, that sucks. How would I not have that? 
That's horrible. I need to update this VM. I don't use this one very much anymore. Well, whatever. All right, so I did some URL decoding, and now I have this stuff. Problem is, I'm still not going to get the best view of it, and I still have a bunch of stuff I need to clean up, like that right there. So, let's see. Let me show you a better text editor. Cool. I, this is a Macintosh application, Sublime Text. I think it's multi platform, actually. But I'm just going to clean up the text in here. So we have these guys right here. This is just a space. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to do a replace on that. Replace that with what? With a space. Oops. And replace all. Bloop. And then see this little slash in right here? Yeah, that's a, a new line, so I need to replace that. Let's see, what's the, I don't use this tool a whole lot. Uh, I want to replace. I wonder if it's going to do that. See if this works. Yeah, it needs to do an eager on it. I don't think this tool. Fine, let me use the real tool that I wanted to use in the freaking first place. Tools have various capabilities. This particular tool does not have the capabilities. I actually thought it had. So I'm over it now. All right, I'm going to use Text Wrangler. The, my, I mentioned Text Wrangler in, I think, session one. It's my favorite. It's my absolute favorite. Okay, here you go. I need to find slash n place of the slash r. There we go. All right, so I have this data decoded somewhat, right? So it looks like I have some HTML for font encoding and art font formatting, excuse me. So here's a message again. And then we have whoop, XML version. So we have less than and greater than. This is still URL encoded, so I'm going to have to say that that one we used wasn't the best thing in the world, but um, less than replace. And greater than replace. Check this out now. What do we have now? From the, an older, much older version of Wireshark, we have an XML file. Hey, what's going on here? And down at the bottom, we have another XML file. And look at this one. is plain as day, easy to see, and includes all these cool coordinates. What? So we take this part of the, the the KML part of this XML document. Make a new document. Save it. Uh, let's just make a temporary folder here. And let's see, what are we doing? Level 4 dot uh, KML. Save. All right, we have a KML file. Let me show you another way to get this KML file. Let's see, where are we here? Multiple tools, right? Let's try another way. If you remember, I told you guys about Network Miner early on. And I said try to avoid it because it – try to avoid it if you can at first because it will give you answers like that. But if you're struggling at all, use it by all means. The most current version is version 1.6.1. .1. Well, completely wrong tool I just clicked on there. And I think this is, yeah, this is 161. And so I take the level 4 PCAP and I drop it into Network Miner. Network Miner will take a while to parse out your packet capture and something that I need to give everyone a very important warning about. As Network Miner parses this PCAP, it's going to extract everything, everything, and it will be sitting in a temporary folder on your computer. There's a reason I only use Network Miner in my malware analysis VM. If you have malware, malicious software, or anything malicious whatsoever, 
and a packet capture, and you open that capture just to look at it. And wires, or excuse me, in Network Miner, that file is now sitting on your hard drive. So be very, very careful for that. Anyways, take a look at this. Uh, Network Miner, it even gives us an MD5 sum. See? Say, here's a file you have open. There's a sum. Look at this. Messages. There's two of them. First one, subject, message in a show. Click. And here's all my data. So this is Network Miner. It's, it makes things a bit easy. If you haven't used it yet, you check it out. So here's the one from Betty to Death Merchant. Dinner and a show. And up here, I just see the... the Stuff I don't care about. At the bottom, look at it. Look how e look at it. Look at it. I, I couldn't even talk. I was so excited. Look how easy. Look how easy it is to read this. Hey, Greg. Look at that. Perfectly formatted. Here's my KML file right here. It's included. The KML file is just look at this. Look. No text filtering required. All that text filtering stuff I did not needed. Not needed at all. Look at this. What? I can just copy this. And paste it. And there's my KML file. Intact. What? Yeah. It's that easy. Actually, it's not that easy. I'm a filthy liar. Look at this. This, this tool parsed it slightly incorrectly. Uh, these are escaped. So you will need to replace slash quote with quote. I just noticed that. See, does um, does Notepad even? I don't. I don't use Notepad ever. Replace. Oh, cool. We can just do it. Notepad. All right. I want to replace slash quote with quote. Replace all. There we go. Now we have our KML file. So the entire thing intact. We'll just call it uh, level four dot KML. And again, what is a KML file? Well, a KML file is something that should be used with Google Earth. That's what it is. So I am going to open up Google Earth. I installed this yesterday, by the way. Up until like a week ago, there were other tools you could use just fine to map multiple sets of coordinates. But I checked last night or yesterday, and they don't work anymore. So there were three of them. Three, and none of them work at this point. So, okay, I was just going to show you. You can just take those coordinates and just take them out and dump them into these online sites, and then it just maps stuff out for you. But, yeah, none of those work. So, whatever. Google Earth, download it, install it. Really easy to install. It works for Windows, Linux, and the Mac. So I'm going to show you the Macintosh version of it. Here we go. I just installed this bad boy yesterday, so I, I'm not a Google Earth person. I don't really know how it works. I just know it's freaking amazing, and you can lose many, many hours by just looking at cool structures on Google Earth. But right now, we're going to go to File, Open, Level 4 KML. Oh, this one must also have the same problem. Okay. Let me edit this bad boy. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Okay, there we go. Uh, yes, so can you see this? No, I'm going to the other screen. Okay, hold on. I'm just removing the slash. Can't talk and type, apparently. The slash, the escaped quotes with regular quotes. So let me just replace that with that. It's all save. Okay, and you should be able to see this now. All right, and here we go. File open. Level 4 KML. And we get the cool zoom in effect. Uh, check that out. What? <gasps> What's that? So we see this is our mapped coordinate information. This is what I refer to as a covert channel. There's an email with a KML file attached. You open the KML file, and the KML file actually doesn't just map out a coordinate or set of coordinates for locations that are fun to visit, but rather we have a password. So let's see. I suck at Google. I'm going to zoom way out. 
How do I? Okay, and then I want to go like this. Nope, I'm going go like this. And like this. Bloop. What's that say? B R U T U S. Brutus. Tis the password. If you zoom in, the buildings kind of get in the way, <laughs> or that building. What is this? Uh. I can't, I don't know what the, but if I zoom in, I'll find out what it is. Holy heck, how much can you zoom in, man? <laughs> That's crazy. What? Huh, it's Caesar's Palace. <laughs> that is, that is really weird. <laughs> okay, anyways. Wow, so I've never used Google Maps. Now I really need to. So, anyways, there we go. Brutus. That's the password. Bam. Done. Okay, so that type of covert channel, is that something you're often going to run into, like at work? No. Is it something that I've run into at work? Not that particular one, but covert channels? Yes, many times, in fact. Especially when employees think they're being slick and trying to communicate in certain ways, but... They're not being slick because we're here. <laughs> All right. So that was level three and that was level four. And let's take a look at our notes. That was pretty much all I had for today. Plus we're at two hours. That's good enough. Okay, wrap up. We talked about hashing, covert channels, and then we went over the homework. And I went over level three and four and tried to go a little slower than I did the last session with the on the first two sessions. So I tried to get a little more step by step, at least on the video. In the Word document, I have like just step by step of how to get the answer for level three. And then for level four, a little more ingenuity as far as the Word document. I don't think I'm gonna add too much on there just this what the video is for. I'll put the time in the video where it starts. And that's it. So I would ask if we had any questions in the chat room, but no one's even chatted in there today at all. So yeah. I'm gonna call that one a wash. All right. So, hey, gang, that's it. That's the end of session three, and I will see you all for session four. See you.